交易者，听起来很酷，没盈利，又什么都不是。K 线之间，你屡败屡战，却屡战屡败，浑然不知，是眼界输了。金钱永不眠，方向不止一边。电波刺穿圈层，声音勾画伦敦。这一刻。为你推开金融城的交易门。Hello， 大家好，欢迎来到伦敦交易者啊，我是 Richard， 希望大家通过我们这样的一个节目，在交易上有所收获。然后这一期节目我们会邀请到的嘉宾是 Adam，Adam Adam 是一个非常资深的交易员，他是前 r a f c o 的呃交易员。那他的传奇呢，是说他是十岁开始就有交易过股票，而十三岁又开始从事交易相关的事情，从二零零零年开始正式的成为一个专业的交易员，在 r a f c o 工作。那这个经历当中，我相信很多的人都会认为他是一个天才交易员，或者从小就对数字特别敏感，对交易这件事情特别向往。大家可以从视频当中去探索一下哦，他过去的一些经历上的特殊性，还有是他见过非常多的自营交易的操作策略。那这也是我们这一期当中的重点。那他详细的介绍了自营公司从两千年开始如何非常疯狂的赚钱。那大家最后一点还可以从我们的视频当中去找到他对于未来的一些行情的一些判断也好，因为他现在主做的都是一些黄金的产品，这也是现在非常热门的一个品种。那这是本期节目最重要的一些内容。那我们废话不多说，就邀请我们的嘉宾 Adam。Hi, Adam. Please say hello to the Chinese audience first. Hello, Chinese traders. My name is Adam Yagelovich, calling from Montreal. And first, we start with quick ask and answer. Okay. No, not now. Futures and stocks, really. Fundamental over the long term. I really don't think so. No. No, never. I'm pretty conservative. When you start trading, I actually started in 1982 when I was 13.、Uh, more investing, really, but I started professionally in 2000. I mean, really, 30. You start from 30 years old. When I was a kid, I didn't know what is trading was. Yeah, the first thing I ever bought was silver in 1979 when I was 10. But I started trading more REIT stocks when I was uh, 13. Uh, so I had an in-trust account, and I took all my money from paper routes and mowing lawns, that type of thing, and started using that to to trade stocks. I know the Rafco they provide lot clearing service. Their clearing service cover all globally. They have office in London and office in New York, Chicago. That was your first job in the early of your trading career. In around 2002, right? Yeah. What is that job? And can you share more stories where you work there?、Uh, but it's a really fun place. Sometimes we'd have some really big days, non-farm payrolls. We, the way we would trade really was on on press releases. So we would sit at the screens and wait for it to come across in the Bloomberg, and we'd have our fingers on the buy and the sell button. Somebody would call out what the number was, and we'd have our targets set in advance on a screen. So we'd have like a little sticky note on the actual screen. So if it was one and a half point, we'd see that as perhaps taking a profit, so on and so forth. And、uh, we we picked the root levels really well because you know we would do a lot of research and, and and try to find out where where the sticky areas were. And there was very little liquidity, so if you didn't hit it in the first second, you weren't going to get any of it. And that worked really well until about 2005, I guess it was. And suddenly everything disappeared. It was like the news was being leaked, and we could no longer trade that way. And that's when it became a lot more difficult to trade. And we were forced to scalp, and we were starting to compete against robots and the flipper. You probably heard of the flipper, and that made trading a lot trickier. So you had to continually change your style. So that's that's how it was. So there were some really good years in there, but things really changed in 2006, 2007. And if you talk to traders, you'll you'll hear the same story. Yeah, that's a great story for us to know. Bill says, when when you work at Rafco, which products you trade most? We focus usually one bond product and one index product, and I traded primarily the euro stocks and the 30-year or the 10-year. Do the traders they trade 
currency futures in Revco or the only trade bond? You could, but you would do it on a on a figure, maybe a ECB announcement or something, but not too many of us trade. There just wasn't the liquidity there in the way we traded scalping. Currencies are terrible. Currency futures are terrible for scalping. How much total volume when you were the traders at Refco on a daily basis? Anywhere between 300 to maybe 500. That was small. I was a small trader. But if you, if you trade this amount of volume in, in the Asian session, that's, that's it's quite big. We know that Refco was bankrupt and in the later on. Do you continue to use their strategy or you change your tra- trading strategy? No, I don't scalp anymore. Why you do you didn't scalp anymore? Very few people still scalp, and it really is a young man's game. I'm too old for it. You are no old man. You are in prime of your life right now. <laughs> Bro, thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel that sometimes, but no. Trading is very tiring. If you're in front of those screens for seven hours a day, staring at the trading ladders and focusing on every single little tick that comes through, after four hours, you're pretty exhausted. You've got a few good trades in the morning, and that should be it. And, you know, it's, it's an old story. Many people who will make their money in the morning, they should just leave by 11. If you haven't made it by 11, you should just go home. And, and scalping is very tiring. I really am too old for that. So I prefer something longer term and more fundamental. What did you learn from this experience, Bill? You have shared a lot. Yeah, in terms of scalping, I can tell you this, that when you're that intensely scalping, you'll notice that the markets change in a period of two weeks, three weeks, and whatever worked for you won't work again. So you have to constantly adapt your strategy. You start to realize how much the computers are affecting the market. You can't think of it as... um, a video game. And, and I know there's a tendency for a lot of young guys to trade too much. That's, that's something that you better quickly learn, that you're there to make your own money, not for anybody else, not for the company. You really have to adapt all the time and constantly learn. There's no end to it. You really have to read a lot and um, constantly adapt your strategy because the markets are always shifting. After you quit the job at Refco and you start a trading education service, you set up OFA, the Online Financial Academy, at 2016. And I think you quite like to do the education stuff. Can you tell me the reason why you like to do that? Sure, there are two main reasons, really. First reason, when you teach trading, you, you become a better trader as well. Because if you make an error people will remember it. So you have to be even more rational about your trades. You need to really be sure when you, when you say something, when you suggest something. You check every box. You, you just do everything correctly. And the other reason uh, really is I, I saw a lot of companies out there that where the, peop, the teachers, the, the people who ran these schools were charlatans. They would have blown up their account maybe four or five times. They would tell everybody that they could become millionaires if they just followed their advice. I know somebody who has rented Lamborghinis, posted fake trading records, and they're famous on YouTube. You know, I'm not going to name names, but these people are out there. And if you see this, you think, oh, they must be successful. They've made all this money trading. You know, there's a a tendency for a lot of people to still want to believe in Santa Claus. There's that cult-like attitude that a lot of people had. A lot of people just feel like they, they need to follow somebody. And it's very dangerous. I I filter them. We might accept 50% of our students. So we don't actually um, accept all our students for that reason. You got a lot of trading experiences in proper trading uh, shop or paper trading firm and also in uh, one of the biggest brokerage firm. What kind of trading style do you like best or you currently using? I mean... Definitely trend following. Can you explain more about your trend following strategy? Sure. If I see a a particular commodity or or stock that uh, has a solid support on it, if I I see a retracement on it, I'll pick some up. If it starts to show continual strength, then I'll add to the position. Once I start to see a little short covering where it starts to get a a very rapid boost, then I'll start to take profits. So it, it really comes down to that. Shorting is more difficult, of course, so I don't short as much. It's, it's a different animal when you're shorting because sometimes you have to go offside longer and it's just easier to trade from the long side. 
Mm. Because you trade like when the market just got a pullback and you made to trend the continuous pattern. I mean, right? When the market will go down or go long again. So I guess you may use Fibonacci retracement quite a lot. Yeah, I do. I do. I do look at Fibonacci's. And you know, usually、uh, if something is in a strong trend, you'll get a few few good pushes over the course of、uh, maybe a couple of months, and you, you wait for that retracement. I'm I'm always looking for the really sure thing, so I'm very select that way. Okay, so which levels you prefer or you use most? You think is most important level thirty eight point two or fifty levels? That's not important. No, what I mean when I'm looking at a level, I'm just looking at an area that it's spent a lot of time around. So it's really market profile idea.、Uh, the longer something spends at an area, then obviously it's more important support. I don't look at Fibonacci's that way. Okay, that's quite interesting. Do you trade news, or you maybe trade after、uh, format meeting? I'll trade、uh, a major news event like the FOMC and look for how the market reacts to the news. So that gives me an idea of confirmation of bias. So those trades can last a couple of days to a week. So I don't need to rush to get in. Plus, there's too much noise around the open as soon as a, a release comes out. I don't trade the NFP or other releases from the BLS anymore. I, but what I will do is I'll look for the second push. So if there's a little retracement, then I'll get in then. But that's、uh, and that's it. I, I won't trade as it comes out. As we all know, the MF Global is、uh, the one of the biggest financial derivatives dealing brokerage. In the world, but but it bankrupt afterwards. When you work with them and work there, you should meet some institution clients or maybe retail clients. Can you give us more case studies or examples? How is that job? Sure. I was only at MF for a very brief period of time as a broker. I really didn't like the brokerage industry, and so I、um, I just went back to trading. It's not about、uh, trading when you're a broker at all. So I didn't really get much out of that. But I can tell you this and. What I've seen over the years is that retail traders they they feel they need to trade. They'll they'll open an account, they'll make a career decision, and they commit to that career. But it becomes like a video game for them, and time moves very、um, very slowly when you're in front of the screen. So at the end of the day, they rack up 60 trades, something ridiculous, and they realize after that they're just giving it all away to commission. They chase momentum, and there's so much noise in the intraday time frame, and then they lack confidence sometimes. So they'll go to some guru or some chat box, some chat room online, and it's like being in an echo chamber. So people will listen to other people. It's just the worst thing that you can do is to start off account with a small amount of capital, chase momentum, and go onto a chat room. It's a recipe for disaster. You have to be very selective and、uh, have something that works for you. And you also have to understand your own mentality. I, for one, I'm not a gunslinger. I know what works for me, what doesn't, and I stick to that. Other people have other ways of doing things. So you just really have to know who you are, focus on one thing, and do it well. And really close your eyes to what other people are doing. Because if you see somebody driving a Lamborghini, Ferrari, or it's just ridiculous, you're going to lose who you are. What you're capable of, and、uh, you're going to start to think like other people. So you think the biggest difference between the retail traders and institutional traders is, for retail side, they think trading is I can win anything. So someone purchase a Lamborghini, so I want to do the same because he get money from the market. He can earn the money from the tra- trading. So they just forgot who they are. They will trade more, or they. We always talk about discipline. Doing when we do doing the trading, but it's so difficult for you to to do that. Can you give some advice to the、uh, retail traders? I think one of the things that、uh, is problematic with a lot of young traders is that they're not fully developed in terms of their own, you know, identity. They feel that they sometimes need to prove something, and that's very dangerous. They really shouldn't think of it as a means to make a lot of money. It is, but they shouldn't think of it that way. They should think of it as a as a chess game. They should enjoy the game itself, and they'll be much better at it. It's a it's a bit of a sports analogy. Sometimes if you're、um, if you're out of the zone, you're not relaxed, and you're、uh, trying too hard, you're going to be awkward on the field.、Uh, whereas if you're relaxed. 
um, and you're just enjoying the game, you'll be able to do things you didn't know you could do before, such as, you know, making sure your average winner is two or three times your average loss. Focus on probabilities. You know, it's all about probabilities. It's rare to find any trader who's making more than 55% of his trade uh, as winners, but you have to maximize those winners. The Pareto rule comes into effect here. 帕累托法则，又名二八定律，指出所有变量中最重要的仅有百分之二十。虽然剩余的百分之八十占了多数，控制的范围却远低于关键的少数。You can't take the market personally. If you start to take the market personally, you know where you become euphoric or the opposite, despondent. These are extremes that you don't want to cultivate. As I mentioned before, you also have to avoid chat rooms and don't fall in love with the money. Trade because you love the strategy, but but you know many young traders or many many retail traders they love chat rooms. I think they're killing themselves that way. I don't know this this is、uh, this maybe is due to the human beings. For the professional traders, you got training quite regularly from proper shop or from institutions. When you enter this market, they told you 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 cannot do this, cannot do that. When you got your experience, when you got the skills, so you maybe can do something else. But for retail side, no one teach them how to do that. They will trust other people more than trust trust themselves. Because when when they enter to that chat room, someone said, "Come on, guys, that's the best choice. That's the best moment to buy gold." So everyone buy gold. So can you give、uh, I mean specific idea or specific plan? And maybe you said trade less if you not. Just forget about the market noise. So, how many trades do they maximum trade in the daily basis? First of all,、um, I don't really believe in trading plans, so to speak. And the reason I say that is because the markets are very dynamic; they're always changing. So, you might say, "Okay, today I'm not going to make more than six trades, and that's it. I'm out for the day." Well, the market might not have six opportunities; it might not have one. So, what are you going to do? Trade? Because your plan says to trade. The other problem I think with a, a trading plan like that is that it it's a very process oriented type of thinking. You're not seizing opportunities where they might be. You're not adaptable. So what you're doing is you're training your mind to think in a very process oriented manner. Whereas what makes a trader great and better than the robots is somebody who can adapt, somebody who is a lateral thinker. I think what young traders need to do. Uh, yeah, the plan is something that a coach will give them if they're they're if they're in a position in trouble and they're making too many trades. But ultimately, what traders should be doing is the moment they sit in front of a screen is think I'm not here to trade. I'm here to read the paper, read the news, and wait for a very very compelling opportunity to arise. If it comes, I'm going to be very active mentally and I'm going to ride it. But really, you're just sitting in front of the screen and you're waiting, waiting, waiting. And that's probably the best advice that I can give them is to not think of trading, but to think of waiting. And、um, it's contrary to the way a lot of people think. They think trading is this exciting thing. And yeah, sure, when you're 20, 21, 22 years old, sitting in front of a bunch of screens with a mouse in your hand and capital, but it, it, there's not a good end to that. The other, the other reason which you mentioned before, Richard. About the psych- psychology component, is I find it's、um, very similar to a cult. There's a cult-like behavior. You see somebody who's making money or apparently making money, and、uh, people feel that they should follow them. And the psychology of the people who go onto those chat rooms or go to those trading schools and just、um, you know just keep fawning over the the head trader. They have a personality that's very similar to a, a cult follower, and that's very dangerous. They're going to lose their money, but they're also going to lose something far more important than that. So, I really advise people to go at their, develop their own style, and have a, a proper mentor. Not somebody who's going to tell you what to do when, but somebody who's going to make you ask your questions rather than answering them. Have you ask them? You didn't believe the trading plan is work because the market is always change, right? But I think the trading plan is give us a bottom line. So, particular for the retail traders, if you're someone maybe hold position over days a week, I'm not sure. There are certain level they have to stop everything if the market go the wrong way. So they give us the bottom line. And do you got any suggestion about control the trading risk when you place orders or you hold the position? For example, the gold. When you long the gold and hold the long position, and what your risk reward ratios when you do that trade? 
you say three to one. This is where the Fibonacci's and market profile come in very useful. So if I see that there's a certain support level and it's starting to break above that, I'm going to look at where my stop loss would be. And then I'll look at the profit target. And if it's about a three to one ratio, that's something I'll take. I might not hold it the whole way, but that's something that I'd be looking for. There used to be a lot of trading legends like George Soros or Jim Rogers. But nowadays, there, this individual hero is less and less. I think it's less and less. Who is the most profitable traders you have ever seen? So give us uh, examples. I don't know if I should name names. Yeah, just a nickname maybe give us. <laughs> AP. He was you know, a very down-to-earth and generous guy. Now he's got a nice young family. He didn't use any technical indicators except for market profile. And he traded the levels. Nothing complicated. He traded all the product. So whether it's oil, euro dollar, the euro, bonds, obviously, the indexes, he traded it all. And he was a very intuitive type of trader. So he was always watching the market. He only had four screens in front of him, but he was always watching the market. And um, he was able to boss, the, boss around the market a lot as he got bigger and bigger. And when I mean big, he would hold 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 lots on the euro dollar or on um, the bond. He might have 500. That's a, that's a massive size. And uh, he was also the first guy, I remember, the day that WTI hit 100. Well, he was the one who was ticking it up, ticking it up every time to, to hit 100. He made a bundle 9-11 when there was nobody in the office, a little story, there was nobody in the office. And uh, he just started as a trader. Twin Towers had fallen. He was alone in the office and he just made a massive trade on going long euro dollar. And that really helped establish his career. <clears throat> he was the best trader I'd ever seen. Very intuitive trader. Yeah, due to your description, that's that the guy is quite, I mean, it's very simple way. He's doing very clear, simple way to, he never use any indicators except market profile or at the levels. So he's just based on the levels and based his experiences to trade. So there's a lot of macro fundamentals. So obviously the relationships between some of the, he's a very smart guy, obviously, and he had really big balls. Not everybody can trade that way, but it really is all between your head. The psychological component is 1,000% the most important thing as a trader. That's all questions I will ask to you today. Thanks so much for you share your trading experiences and your idea or your opinions with the Chinese audience. Thank you so much. 大家看过这个视频之后我相信会有很多的一些难点的地方他跟我们分享了很多的自营交易上面的一些内幕的信息他这边前面说到了在两千年左右的时候很多的行情是非常好做的也就是当你经济比较小的时候我们说市场流动性